Doctor Ethan Dimitrowski es graduado magna cum laude por la Universidad de Harvard y la Universidad de Cornell. Su equipo ayudó al establecimiento de la terapia de diferenciación basada en retinoides para el tratamiento de la leucemia mieloide aguda y el desarrollo de la prueba de diagnóstico de esta leucemia. El doctor Dimitrovsky ha publicado 171 artículos, de los cuales 138 resultan de investigación original. Desde 2008 es miembro de la Sociedad Americana de Cáncer y actualmente es investigador del Centro de Cáncer MD Anderson. Buenos días. I wish I could deliver my address in Spanish, so please uh, accept my apologies. Let me begin by saying, since I come from Houston and we suffered a terrible disaster ourselves, that we have so much concern and compassion for the people of Puebla, Mexico City, and the Mexican people for all that you've suffered, and we wish you a speedy recovery. So today, um, it's a particular honor for me to be here at this historic gathering to uh, welcome people from near and far and to have this opportunity to deliver this address. And um, I'm especially um, interested in telling you about a discovery that my laboratory has made. We've called it anaphase catastrophe, and it's a way to uh, eradicate, to kill aneuploid cancers, a general mechanism for eradicating cancers. And so I'm going, I've decided today to tell you a story, a scientific story, that began at the bench and moved into the clinic in work that we had conducted using retinoids, vitamin A derivatives, that led to a, a new way to, to treat a rare but lethal can cancer, a leukemia, acute promyelocytic leukemia, and unbelievably, surprisingly, it's led to a new way to combat lung cancer, the most common cause of cancer death in our country and in Mexico. This approach targets a hallmark of cancer, And it's uh, the hallmark that we've targeted is chromosome instability, and it engages a pathway that we've described that we have called anaphase catastrophe. And it's a pathway that we're now moving into the cancer clinic. Let me begin this scientific story by telling you about the retinoids. This is a scientific case study of translational research. Retinoids are natural and synthetic derivatives of vitamin A, which is essential for vision, fertility, and immune function, which I won't talk about today. But retinoids, in addition to their role in development as a teratogen, have a powerful effect in benefiting cancer patients. And this was first shown in the disease, the leukemia, acute promyositic leukemia. The treatment with retinoids occurs through nuclear receptors, and I'm going to take you through this pathway and take a moment to give you a primer. This is all you really need to know about the pathway to understand the discoveries that we've made. All transretinoic acid is a natural ligand. It's a hormone for a nuclear family called the retinoic acid receptors, of which there are three family members that are called alpha, beta, and gamma. They differ in their hormone or ligand binding domain, and they are related to uh, another family of receptors called the retinoid X receptors that are activated through a drug called vexeratine. All transretinoic acid is a drug that we played a role in it becoming FDA approved, and vexeratine is also FDA approved uh, for uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Vexeratine is an agent that acts in the clinic by largely activating the RxR pathway. ATRA, or all transretinoic acid, only activates the nuclear receptors called the RERs. Um, years ago, we um, made a discovery that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine that I'll describe quite uh, quickly from work that was first uncovered in China and subsequently confirmed in the first American trial that we ran. To, in this image, you see the uh, leukemic cells, APL, before treatment with the drug, all transretinoic acid, and after just two weeks of therapy, there is an obvious major change in the morphology of these cells. And if you look uh, closely, you will notice on the right panel that there are linear rods in the cytoplasm, and those are called our rods, and they only occur in leukemic cells. So we knew these maturing cells were of leukemic origin, a point that we confirmed um, 
by genetically testing for the rearrangement that we uncovered. This is the 1517 classic presentation of APL. And in concert with Ron Evans at the Salk Institute, we published in the journal Cell the cloning of PML or alpha. And what we uncovered was that the abnormal receptor called PML or alpha turned the normally active uh, transcriptional process off, like a light switch. But when the drug retinoic acid was added to uh, leukemic patients, um, we found that we could do something unbelievable to us before, and that was to destroy the oncogenic cancer-causing protein that we had cloned called PML or alpha. And all this happens in but a few weeks, and over the course of several year, years of, of work by my lab and many other laboratories, um, not only was this drug approved by the FDA, but we looked at this as one of the early successes of what's called targeted therapy, of um, the example of a drug targeting an oncogenic protein that led to the remission of patients. These were heady days in my lab. We developed a genetic test for the disease. We published the first transgenic model for this, um, for this disease and published it in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And um, I did an experiment. Uh, the experiment that I did is that I uh, did a, pep, a PubMed search for the number of papers that were published with the word retinoic acid and APL. And I found that there were more annual papers published than there were annual cases in the United States. And since this was a solved clinical problem by the advent of retinoic acid-based therapy, where before only about 25% of patients are cured, and now it's thought that 95% of patients are cured with retinoic acid-based therapy, I thought I would move from this uh, example of successful differentiation therapy into another uh, human disorder. And the question that we posed is, what could we take, what could we learn from this discovery? And what we learned from this discovery that might have been applied to another cancer was the retinoic acid uh, uh, drug was inducing the destruction of a cancer-causing protein. We decided to focus our energies on lung cancer. Why? Because there had been a large body of literature suggesting that there was an inverse relationship between lung cancer incidence and serum vitamin A and retinol levels. Lung cancer is a devastating problem. Uh, it sadly took in 2016 uh, um, nearly, nearly 160,000 lives in the United States, and over 200,000 people were diagnosed with this cancer. It comes in two varieties, small cell lung cancer, which is less common than non-small cell lung cancer. Today I'll be only talking about non-small cell lung cancer. And despite so many years of research, so many years of uh, treatment with radiation therapy, with surgery, with chemotherapy, still only 17% of all patients with lung cancer survive um, five years. So this is a devastating clinical problem, and um, that you already know. Perhaps I could tell you something do you, that you may not yet know. And that is that even if, retinoc even if uh, tobacco, the cause of smoking, the smoking, which is the cause of lung cancer, even if all tobacco use were to stop today, lung cancer in my country and in your country will remain a devastating problem for years to come. Why? Because more lung cancer is diagnosed today in never and former smokers than in current smokers in the United States. The second point that I'd like to tell you by looking at these uh, well-known figures that you've probably seen from the published literature is that more men are diagnosed with lung cancer than women. But this is a major problem for women's health because the sad fact is that more women pass away from lung cancer than from any other cancer, including breast cancer. So there's a pressing need for us to find new ways to combat lung cancer. And my laboratory decided to uh, conduct an experiment which turned out to be highly informative. And this is a summary of work that we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. What we did is we took immortalized lung epithelial cells, shown in the upper panel, and in the absence of uh, tobacco-related carcinogens, these cells obviously remain benign. And if you take these benign cells and then add the carcinogen that causes lung cancer, 
either cigarette smoke condensate or the tobacco carcinogen NNK, we could convert these benign cells to malignant cells. And so the question that we posed is if you co-treated with retinoic acid and the carcinogen, would the benign cells stay benign? Would they be chemoprevented or would they uh, become malignant? And we found that they remained benign. Uh, over the course of a number of years, we uncovered the mechanism responsible for this chemoprevention. And it involves a direct effect upon the cell cycle. This is a, a typical image of the cell cycle. I'm going to focus your attention on the so-called G1 phase of the cell cycle. What we found was that retinoids, the retinoic acid receptor agonists like Atra, or rexinoids like Vexeratine, were each independently able to destroy the G1 proteins, either cyclin D1 or cyclin E, conferring checkpoint arrest. And we sought to uncover the mechanisms involved. And as we were doing that, we also found that the epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors were also able to suppress the expression of these same proteins, but through a completely different mechanism. What was the mechanism that we uncovered? What we had found was that as it had done in the APL example, retinoic acid was inducing the destruction of another cancer-causing protein. In this case, cyclin D1, or as we showed later, cyclin E. In the left-hand panel, you can see that we have in, vi in vitro translated the protein, um, cyclin D1, and then applied to that in vitro translated protein cellular extracts from lung uh, epithelial cells that were previously treated with retinoic acid. So there's no drug in this, in this experiment. Instead, we add the lysates. And as you can see in the left-hand panel, we were able to degrade in the laboratory, in the test tube, cyclin D1 protein. But in the right panel, we uncovered the mechanism, and we found there was a specific phosphorylation site at a threonine residue, residue 286. That phosphorylation event triggered, as you can see in the right panel, polyubiquitinated cyclin D1 species. If you simply transverse that one residue from a threonine to an alanine, you can abrogate this entire destruction pathway. And we went on to show that the kinase involved is GSK, we spent many years uncovering the mechanisms, and I'm not going to talk about that work. Rather, I wanted to tell you that this is a general mechanism of how retinoids and rexinoids work. As you remember, there were three family members of the retinoic acid receptor family, and what we had found in my laboratory was that this, the major transmitter of the signal was the second retinoic acid receptor, RAR beta. But at the same time, Paradoxically, we found that whenever people smoke, the very first thing that seems to happen is we silence that receptor. Many large clinical trials of thousands of patients were conducted to see whether retinoic acid could prevent lung cancers in patients who formerly had early stage lung cancer, and they all were unsuccessful, sadly. And the reason is the retinoic acid receptor was silenced. The drug worked through a receptor that was no longer there so that the drug could never work in people. But we did not lose heart because we found that the same pathway that we uncovered was still able to be activated, but activated through the second family members, the rexinoid, the drug bexeratine. And we found that we could still destroy these cancer-causing proteins. And we sought over the course of 10 years to conduct five clinical trials, all of which had achieved their outcome. These were so-called phase zero trials where we asked the question, does the drug, the rexinoid, get to the target, affect the target in the preclinical versus post, uh, pre-surgical versus post-surgical setting of lung cancer patients. We found that the very targets that we saw affected in the laboratory were affected in the patient's tumors. And we saw this with a rexinoid trial with the erlotinib EGFR tyrosine kinase therapy trial. We saw this in our first in man phase one study, and we found quite unexpectedly that there were 
major clinical responses in our phase one study, whether or not they were activating EGFR uh, mutations. And as you heard from the talk earlier today, it's the presence of the activating EGFR mutations that seem to dictate those patients who are most responsive, suggesting we had broadened the, the scope of activity in the clinic. And then we went on <coughs> to conduct a phase two study that showed a survival advantage, but this time a very uh, surprising um, observation was that the KRAS oncogene had uh, tumors that responded. <coughs> the KRAS oncogene is typically associated with resistance to therapy, and we found that the patient's tumors still responded. So that led us to um, window of opportunity trials. Here's a characteristic example of one of the five trials that we conducted. On the right, you can see the post-treatment biopsy of a patient treated just for 10 days of therapy. On the left, the pretreatment. And you don't need to be a pathologist to see that each of these biomarkers fell in the post-treatment versus the pretreatment biopsies. We then went on to conduct both phase one and phase two trials. And uh, this was combining the rexanoid with the epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or LOTNIP. And again, you don't need to be a radiologist to see that in the right-hand panel, after three months of therapy, there's a dramatic improvement of this patient's lung cancer as compared to the pretreatment biopsy where the arrow indicates that the patient's um, malignant uh, acidic fluid was present but decreased dramatically after therapy. The reason that we were so excited about this work was that the patients who responded, responded whether or not they had <coughs> activating mutations of the epidermal growth factor receptor. And unbelievably, whether or not they had activating mutations of the KRAS oncogene. In this figure, <coughs> we sequenced the tumor and found that this responding patient's lung cancer did not have an activating mutation. So this suggested that we had broadened the activity to include EGFR-based therapy, to include rexinoids that showed that we could see responses whether or not <coughs> there were KRAS mutations or the absence of EGFR mutations. So again, I'm a physician scientist. I work in the, in the laboratory and I work in the clinic. And I was very interested, <coughs> excuse me, in uncovering the mechanism involved. And over the course of many years, we published a series of papers that show precisely how we induce this ubiquitin-dependent degradation. But we were particularly interested in the possibility that there might have been yet another degradation program that the rexinoids were inducing. Oh, thank you. And over the course of the last um, few years, we found that pathway. And that pathway is one that involves <clears throat> a ubiquitin-like species called ISG-15. ISG-15, like ubiquitin, complexes with cyclin D1 and destabilizes it. Both of these pathways are druggable. Of this new pathway that we've uncovered, there is a specific enzyme in d ubiquitinase called UBP43. It's also called USP18. And this is a very fascinating enzyme that's worth targeting in the clinic because it only removes ISG15 from target proteins. So um, I wish I had time to tell you about this pathway. It's a major interest of my laboratory, and unfortunately, time doesn't permit, because what I'd like to do is tell you how we discovered this pathway anaphase catastrophe. 
This came about because we were first interested in wondering whether we could create a lung cancer simply by deregulating the cyclin destruction pathway that I've just described to you. And so we published a paper in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where we engineered mice that deregulated the cyclin E pathway. And these mice developed lung cancers. Not only did they develop lung cancers, they developed pre-malignancy of the lung. And a pathognomonic uh, feature of cyclin E overexpression is chromosome instability. We generated cell lines from the mouse lung cancers, and although <clears throat> the mice developed lung cancers in about three to four months, when we injected these mouse lung cancers back into the mice from which they were derived, <coughs> they developed lung cancers in just a few weeks. Chromosome instability is a hallmark of cancer. And this has been pointed out by Bob Weinberg as one of the key features, genomic instability. And one of the questions was, was genomic instability a target or cause of cancer? Could you attack aneuploid tumors? We pose this question by asking whether a cyclin E-dependent kinase inhibitor, like Silisoclub shown here, would lead cells to be addicted to this kinase pathway. What was very interesting about this work that we conducted from our point of view is that the inhibitor was a fully reversible inhibitor, but we found in the laboratory it acted irreversibly. And that led us to the pathway that I want to emphasize today, and it's called anaphase catastrophe. <coughs> this is a summary of the pathway from a review article that we wrote about this pathway a few years ago in clinical cancer research. Essentially what's happened is that aneuploid tumor cells cannot condense their chromosomes when they go through anaphase. They develop multiple spindles and they die. This is what the cells look like. You can see the control cells with the bipolar cell, the CDK2 inhibitor siliciclib, leading to a tripartite cell that dies at anaphase. And you can achieve the same result with knockdown of CDK2. This pathway we have found to be active in all aneuploid tumor cells. But what's really interesting is that it spares diploid cells, just as you would expect. Hence, this would give us a therapeutic window. What I'm going to do now is show you the fate of the cell. Here's a lung cancer cell that it's tripartite. Now watch what happens to the fate of these cells. It's dividing, condensing, and dying. And so here you can see the fate of one cell as it begins to die, condensing. See it? And now the second cell. The third daughter cell is below the phase of the uh, focal plane, so that's why you can't see this. And by live cell imaging, you can actually look at this death program and relate it to the induction of apoptosis. That's what we've done here. The yellow and the red arrows show you the daughter cells. And what we found was 
the cells go through anaphase. They're living in, until they go through anaphase. And then they induce apoptosis and die. <coughs> we are just incredibly intrigued by this pathway. What this figure shows is that anaphase catastrophe signals both in murine cancer cells and human lung cancer cells whether or not there are RAS mutations. And RAS <coughs> mutations of lung cancer represent an unmet med medical need. But look in the left-hand side of this figure. There are two cells that seem to be resistant. Both of those cells don't undergo anaphase catastrophe because both of those cells are nearly diploid. I then set up a collaboration with um, Jeff Settleman when he was at Harvard. And we did a robotic screen of 280 cancer cell lines. Most of th them were um, lung cancer cells. <clears throat> And you can, sh you can see growth inhibition in the upper panel. Black bars indicate dramatic growth inhibition, more than 50%. Gray is more than 25%. And white is less than 25%. So nearly every cell responded. But if you look at the lower panel, here's where the story became intriguing to us. We found that of the 15 most sensitive cells, 14 of them had RAS mutations. So what we had found was a way to treat an unmet medical need. That is, RAS mutations in lung cancer represent an unmet medical need. On the right-hand panel are the 15 least sensitive cell lines. None of them had RAS mutations. So we set out to discover the cause for the sensitivity to RAS mutations, and we postulated in my laboratory that there must exi exist a factor that we called factor X. That factor had the following properties. It must be regulated by the KRAS oncoprotein, and, and secondly, it must be a direct phosphorylation target of cyclindibenic kinase II. Um, over the course of a number of years, we used a candidate gene approach, and we analyzed 20 proteins until we found the one that fulfilled these two cr criteria. And satisfyingly, it was a centrosome protein called CP110. CP110 appears to be the key mediator of anaphase catastrophe. It's a phosphoprotein, it's directly phosphorylated by CDK2, and it has 10 potential phosphorylation sites. And we found the two that drive anaphase catastrophe shown in the um, rectangles. Uncovering a mediator of anaphase catastrophe then gave us a window into how to build on this work. So the first question we asked was, if CP110 is driven by the KRAS oncogene, if CP110's response is driven by the KRAS oncogene, if we were to overexpress CP110, we should antagonize the CDK2 inhibitor's effects, and that's exactly what we discovered. And then, um, thank you. The complementary experiment is to genetically lose expression of CP110. And that enhanced the anti-neoplastic effects of this drug. But there's more that we could pursue mechanistically. Was there a direct relationship between CP110 protein, the centrosome protein controlling anaphase catastrophe, and the, and the uh, KRAS oncogene? And what we found was that the KRAS oncogene directly regulated 
the expression of CP110 causing anaphase catastrophe to be promoted. And if you look at this figure under panel A, you can see when we overexpressed the malignant in malignant lung cancer cells, the KRS oncogene, when they didn't express it before, we drove down expression of CP110. So this is um, clinically relevant observation. It's biologically relevant. How is it biologically relevant? We went back to the transgenic lung cancer models that we had on developed. <clears throat> and what we found when we compared our model, which was not driven by KRAS, to Tyler Jack's KRAS mutant-driven lung cancer model, by use of a CP110 immunostatic chemical assay, you can see the intensity of expression of CP110 was less in those transgenic lung cancers that uh, express the KRAS oncogene. This led us to consider the possibility was clinically relevant. And so we looked at 550, <coughs> excuse me, 550 human lung cancer cases. And we asked the question, immunostochemically, whether CP110 expression in human lung cancers was related to expression of the KRAS oncogene, and it was. We found that there was a highly statistically significant reduction in CP110 levels in human lung cancer cases that had the KRAS oncogene expressed. We went on to use live cell imaging to dissect this pathway further. And we found that there were particular phosphorylation events, direct phosphorylation events of CDK2, <coughs> excuse me, of CDK2 driven that involved only two residues that controlled anaphase catastrophe. And so by meticulously examining the 10 sites individually, we found the two shown here that are phosphorylation targets. Here's where the story became even more unexpectedly interesting. We found that the KRAS oncogene itself could destabilize the centrosome protein controlling anaphase catastrophe. Here's an experiment where we introduced the KRAS onca protein and showed that we could destabilize CP110. Now remember, this is biologically and clinically relevant. Driving down the expression of CP110 will enhance the response to CDK2 inhibitors. And we pursued over several years the mechanism. And what we found was that, as shown in this figure, overexpression of the KRAS oncogene redu <coughs> reduces the expression of the cyclin F protein. Cyclin F is an incredibly interesting protein. Why? because others had shown that in Drosophila cells, cyclin F controls the regulatory cycle of CP110. So in a sense, what we had uncovered were two states, one driven by KRAS, which augmented cyclin F expression leading to the proteasome-dependent destruction of CP110 or not. So the presence of the KRAS mutant protein overexpressed cyclin F, accelerated the CP110 destabilization, and, le and led to its destruction. 
<coughs> so here's the mechanism. The KRAS oncoprotein is leading to downstream signals that destabilize the very regulator of CP110 and anaphase catastrophe. The inhibitor that we used was a first-generation inhibitor, and I'm going to now tell you very quickly a story we recently published in the journal of the National Cancer Institute with a second-generation inhibitor that has just moved into the clinic. And what we found is, as shown in these figures, that this new inhibitor is more than tenfold more potent than the inhibitor that I just described to you. To give us confidence that this inhibitor is acting through the RAS program, we did a um, <coughs> robotic screen shown in panel E. And once again, only those KRAS-driven tumors were most responsive to CDK2 inhibition with this next generation inhibitor. We wanted to satisfy ourselves that this inhibitor was inducing anaphase catastrophe, and it is, as shown in panel B. This inhibitor, we predicted, would be even more potent in eradicating aneuploid cancers. And the mechanism that we found was that it had it inhibits the clustering of centrosomes, thereby promoting the CDK2 inhibitory effect. Once again, if our hypothesis is correct, we should relatively spare normal cells. And that's what this figure shows you, both in panel A and panel B, the CT, C, C10 cells and BS2B cells are both non-malignant, immortalized, respectively murine and human um, lung cells. But you can see all the cancer cells were highly responsive. <coughs> we decided to move this work into a syngenaic mouse lung cancer model. And as you can see in this figure, the mice-bearing syngenetic tumors had dramatic reduction in the course of treatment. And what was satisfying to us is that not only was there a statistically significant reduction, but in shown in panel B, the mice tolerated the therapy very well. <coughs> But the drug that I've just shown you is a tool compound. And so we went back and reproduced this work with the drug that's being used in the clinic called CYC065 and repeated all the work that I just showed you. This is an incredibly potent um, drug to treat lung cancers and to treat any aneuploid tumors. And CYC065 is now undergoing phase one testing. I don't want to leave you with the idea that only CDK2 inhibition will be a useful pharmacologic tool. We used a pan-CDK inhibitor last year to show that it, through actions on both CDK1 and 2, anaphase catastrophe is induced. And then the story that I've been telling you gets even more interesting. After we published this work, I got a call from TACMAC. TACMAC had just published a paper in Cancer Cell that looked identical to the anaphase catastrophe cells that I've told you about today. But this time, he showed the same cells with a uh, polokinase 4 inhibitor. Polokinase 4 regulates also centrosome duplication. 
And as you can see by this analysis that we did of the Cancer Genome Atlas, it is um, dif differentially expressed in malignant versus normal lung tissues. TAC has identified a lead PLK4 inhibitor that I'm going to show you some preliminary results. And um, this is a, a new way to induce death of cancer cells. PLK4 is expressed at very low levels. In fact, we spent quite a bit of energy to try to detect the protein. We were unsuccessful. So in order to independently corroborate the, the um, Cancer Genome Atlas results, we used RNA, RNA in situ analysis. <coughs> and that analysis shows a negative prognostic effect of PLK4 overexpression in human lung cancer cases. This um, result has given us encouragement that PLK4 inhibitor is a new way for inducing death of aneuploid cancer cells. And our preliminary results shown here confirm that result. PLK4 inhibition promotes polyploidy and lung cancer death. In panel A, you can see that the drug induces a polyploid state. As before, we found that polyploidy led to apoptotic death, result that um, I won't show in the interest of time. But instead, what I'd like to show you is that PLK4 inhibition induces death of cancer cells by overduplicating centrosomes. Here's our in vivo experiments with syngeneic mouse models, shown in panel A. And in a dose-dependent manner, we showed that we could eradicate the syngeneic lung cancers in mice. This led to a statistically significant reduction in the size of the tumors. But here's um, what we did that gave us encouragement, is that we analyzed the appearance of the dying tumor cells in the mouse syngeneic model and recapitulated the same, uh, the same aberrant cells that we saw in culture, giving us confidence that the pathway that we uncovered in cells is preserved in mouse models. And we hope to analyze the similar effect in the phase one study that's underway. But here's what the cells look like if you, with respect to their centrosomes. What we found was that cells with supernumerary centrosomes were dramatically increased in number. And here you can see this overduplication provides you the mechanism to understand how the death program occurs. The death program occurs because as the cells enter mitosis, the spindles can't attach to all the aberrant centrosomes. And as a result, you have this, these bizarre looking cells that are shown here that leads to, to the, the death of the, the tumor cells. So what I've told you today <clears throat> is that using retinoids as a tool, we have uncovered multiple therapeutic pathways. We've uncovered pathways that lead to destabilization of cancer-causing proteins. And we've uncovered this new death program that we've called anaphase catastrophe. I want to point out by the work I just showed you about PLK4 inhibition 
that this is distinct from what has been called mitotic catastrophe. Do you remember the video that I showed you about the death of the, of the daughter cells? The death occurs only in the daughter cells. In contrast, in mitotic catastrophe, you have death of cells as they enter mitosis. So we've come full circle. Activation of anaphase catastrophe eradicates aneuploid cancer cells, but relatively spares normal cells. Why? Because normal cells are able to progress through the cell cycle, and the absence of supernary centrosomes allow, allow, allow them to progress without any difficulty. I've told you that CDK2 inhibition that induces anaphase catastrophe occurs through a centrosome protein called CP110. And unexpectedly, if the KRAS oncogene is expressed, anaphase catastrophe seems to be a very attractive way to eradicate tumor cells because the KRAS oncogene destabilizes CP110. I've also told you that other inhibitors now exist that can eradicate aneuploid cancer cells, but do so through mitotic catastrophe. Based on this work, we propose use of these inhibitors in the lung and other cancer clinics to eradicate cancers even when the KRAS oncogene is present. So today I've told you a story that's um, lasted over um, more than a decade of bench-to-bedside research. And it's an idealized version where one starts at the bench and you have a direction to go in to move it into the clinic, but oftentimes we fail because there's no direct path. Rather, a better way to describe that is a disrupted path that we follow that has to be bridged by the gap of knowledge through window of opportunity trials, through use of predictive cell and experimental models like transgenic models, but most importantly by interdisciplinary teams. It includes staff, it includes students, includes postdoctoral fellows and faculty. And the work that I've described to you today has really been done by many others in my laboratory and in my, by my collaborators, and I largely serve as a spokesperson for their work. And um, here are my colleagues who contributed to all that work. The work began when I was a faculty member at Sloan Kettering, continued at Dartmouth, and continues now at MD Anderson. Thank you so much for your attention. I really enjoyed being part of this conference. Thank you.